welcome back to Aimless Ramblings. This is episode 11, and uh, today I've been put forward to put up the topic, which uh, at the current moment is going to be humor in its different respects and whatnot. Um, and surprisingly, I've also been put in the first spot for talking. So I'm just going to discuss from my background in psychology and how humor has been you know, used and what it is actually used in. Humor is a social function. That humor is how we interact with one another. It's not, it harkens back to that whole entire thing that humanity needs a, like, community to survive. And as such, it has built itself to allow us to interact with one another. The, so this is a very interesting discussion. It's a little bit dry in areas, but it mainly discusses what's the social importance of humor however where i found this was really interesting was when i looked at the most uh up-to-date um papers in this area and it's interesting how this is now being used towards uh leaders and towards uh ceos and whatnot and how humor is actually used in developing a sense of uh trustworthiness and like interaction between uh employers and employees um so yeah from a larger standpoint, it's now being used as a tool, whereas it used to be used as like a way to connect parties together. It's now a way to gain uh, tr trust and uh, reliability between higher and lower things. Uh, Sam, you had something you wanted to say in this area? Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering if it's possibly just become more intentionally used as a tool because, you know, I'm sure he, like historically the funny guy, you know, always sent, seemed more relatable so maybe now it's just cynical um, attempts at using humor to you know make family within an organization whereas historically it just would have been the natural occurrence so i'm not sure if it's a new thing in leadership it could just be a new thing that they're trying to force I don't know thoughts uh definitely definitely yeah um I feel like in the respect where I was referring to it as a tool, I was referring to it as like a forceful like element rather than like it's always been some an element of leadership using this sort of thing, gaining trustworthiness to be able to have people work under you that are willing to do the job you want them to do. And I feel like uh, I misstep by saying it was a tool. It's always been used as a tool. I just meant it was more used as a thing that's been trained into leadership and to make them more successful at what they do. Surprisingly, this also brought up a really interesting thing, as you were saying, like uh, families and whatnot. Uh, this is a slight tangent, but I'm re referring to uh, the Christmas joke. If you've always noticed, they're really horrible, and they're actually designed perfectly to be like that because Christmas and times like that are to bring people together. So what they do is they deliberately make jokes that are horrifying. So it's everybody versus the joke rather than the usual divide, which you get is people who get the joke and people who don't get the joke. So they make them very simple and they also make them very horrible. So everybody, like, it's everybody against the joke to sort of bring everybody together, which I thought was a really interesting concept. Um, That's surprisingly yeah. wholesome. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Um, well, anyway, that's unless anybody else has anything else they want to discuss in this area, I might pass over to Tim. Uh, Tim, you have something to say? Yes. I was actually just wondering, Simon, uh, so you've talked about like how humor can be a tool and can be uh, sort of implemented in a utility context to create social function and that it can be utilized to attempt to sort of draw together a societal grouping. Something I am interested in though is like I think like personally, and once again, this is anecdotal, but there's nothing worse than a forced joke. So authenticity and sort of spontaneity seems like a pretty important aspect of humor. So just throwing back to you, do you think that by an attempt to turn humor more cynically, as Sam said, into a tool of leadership, you actually, for want of a better term, kill the joke? And as such, Really, if people are looking at using humor as a mechanism of bringing together an organization, they should instead, you know, the old age old sage advice, just be themselves. Um, yeah, that's a really interesting one. I feel like it's more using blanket jokes, like pre written jokes to sort of break the ice rather than actually create humor, which, you know, it's a bit shooting myself in the foot saying that humor isn't for humor sake. But yeah, uh, Sam, you have something to better discuss this?
Oh uh, yeah, I was just thinking, you know, uh, in terms of forced humor, you know, like a lot of stand-up comedians, for instance, have a pre-prepared script. So they walk out onto that stage and deliver pre-prepared, canned, you could say forced material, but it's funny because the way in which they can present it makes it seem as though it's spontaneous, despite the fact it's actually not. So, you know, it could be that you only notice the ones that are shitty and the ones that have been trained to, um, you know, come off as, as actually genuine, just seem genuine despite being scripted. How cynical? Maybe too cynical. Yeah, that's uh, an interesting one, I suppose, that I hadn't really considered. But I suppose one of the other things that's important for a stand-up comedian is their ability to read the crowd. And um, having been at many amateur and uh, semi-pro kind of uh, stand-up comedy events, I've seen people crash and burn when they haven't really effectively read the crowd. And particularly in Canberra when you're talking about a certain type of market of uh, people compared to, say, for instance, if you're doing stand-up comedy in a club or a pub in Western Sydney where the socioeconomic and cultural demographic may be very different. So, Simon? Um, further on this entire thing of like picking a crowd, there's also a social contract. So, for example, we're talking about people who are already under Irving because they're talking to somebody that's higher up in a business. So there's a particular level of they're just showing themselves as humans. So there's that social contract of this person's in charge of me in this setting, whereas uh, there's also that social contract when it comes to stand-up comedians where you have that concept of somebody saying concept a bunch, which isn't humorous. Um, <laughs> you get the thing of people going, okay, I'm coming here to be entertained and as such I will suspend my disbelief and you know to a point – some of the people, the way that they see that suspended disbelief is that they decide, oh, well, I don't have to act like a normal human. This is my like outlet to, you know, heckle somebody. Some people see it as, a, oh, well, you know, I can just now sit here and just get passive entertainment from a comedian. And I feel like it's maintaining that balance is working out where jokes and humor can fit into society and where they sort of feel a bit more forced. So, for example, making a joke at a funeral – you might get a couple of giggles, but, you know, if it's appropriate, it's allowed. But if it's inappropriate, it's really not the right place to do it. So it's that maintaining time and place. And that's with a lot of things anyway. Um, anyway, uh, unless you guys have anything more to say, I might hand over to Tim, who's going to be talking about humor and hatred. Yeah, well, thank you, Simon. Uh, basically, what before we can really get into the depth of what I want to talk about, which is bigotry and humor, uh, I suppose we, I think we need to sort of examine, at least from my readings and my perspective, how humor works. So, a joke as uh, a sort of like societal convention generally plays upon the subsur subversion of an expected outcome. So something is generally seen as humorous when it is unexpected. Now, I mean, obviously – this doesn't necessarily play out um, when you're talking about expectation management when there's an active detriment to a person involved in it. That's just a unexpected or unforeseen accident, uh, which can actually be pretty heartbreaking depending on how it plays out. But um, generally speaking, when you have a, a situation which is unexpected or does not conform to the societal norms of the setting in which it's occurring, that can be seen as humorous. So uh, an example is, uh, for instance, uh, a bunch of people coming together uh, and – listening to a comic talk about an everyday social situation and this this comic goes into great detail uh, describing the situation and then right at the end they drop the punchline and it turns out the entire time they, were, they weren't talking about their partner, they were talking about their dog despite the fact they described a loving relationship uh, with all this uh, sort of interaction. And so, and so that's where the humour comes from is from the mis misperception of what – the initial story circumstances, and then the sudden rev revelation that all along it was actually something else that everyone wasn't expecting. Um, and I, I mean, this sort of subversion of expectancy kind of – it changes depending on the type of joke. So like another really common type of joke, which leads quite nicely into uh, what I'm going to be talking about, which is humor and hatred, is uh, – it's a sort of like an archetype uh, known as the – uh, the moron joke. So basically, it's where uh, we discuss a certain social circumstance with certain expected outcomes, uh, and 
and and a person doesn't conform to to the to the end outcome. Uh, a great example of a a moron joke. So uh, we'll use relatively benign monkeys here. So let's say New South Wales and Vic Queenslanders for an Australian context here. So a a New South Welshman is in in a bar. He's serving at the bar as a bartender, and a Queenslander comes in, and the Queenslander comes in and says, uh, "I'll have three shots." And he's like, oh, okay, uh, who, who are the shots for you by yourself? He's like, oh, yeah, so one shot's for me and the other two shots are for my two brothers. One is in the US and one who's in the UK. And I like to have a drink just to remember them once a week. It's like, oh, that's great. And so this continues uh, for a couple of months. They have, uh, uh, you know, he comes in every, every week and has his three shots. And then one week he comes in and he only orders two shots. And the bartender's like, oh, well, I'm really sorry for your loss. And the guy's like, well, what are you talking about? He's like, well, you've only ordered two shots. So I'm assuming that you know one of your, one of your brothers has passed away. He's like, oh, no, no, no. The two shots are still for my brothers. It's just that I'm on the bandwagon, so I'm not drinking this week. And so once again, this is a, a joke which plays on the humor, which is the expectancy that when an individual has taken a certain action, that there's a certain outcome. So, you know, honoring his now dead brother by not having a drink, but instead because this person is – stupid in this particular case or a moron, they have, by considering themselves to be on the bandwagon and not drinking, are still drinking for their two brothers. Now, when it comes to humor and hate, obviously these kinds of jokes and this particular archetype of joke, the moron joke, we see the potentiality for degrading stereotypes to be used for different types of social groups and particularly social groups which have been historically marginalized within different communities. And every community has this joke, like, uh, you know, the, the British have Irish jokes, the, uh, the French have Belgium jokes, and the Belgians have French jokes. Uh, but uh, the, once again, the, these jokes can have a harmful societal effect. But one of the questions I want to throw to you two guys, can a joke – be bigoted and harmful, so for instance, a racist joke or a sexist joke, but still, by definition, be funny. Because there's been a lot of movement, particularly in recent years, where you know harmful jokes, particularly rape jokes and such, have been targeted uh, by different campaigners, diff- a changing social mood, and the, and the joke has been labelled as offensive. But if it's seen within its within its archetype. Can that joke be seen as still funny despite being offensive? And I, I throw that open to you first, Sam. So I'm going to make Simon real happy here by um, quoting Freud. <laughs> yeah. um, so only when we rise to a society of a more refined education do formal conditions for jokes play a part. The smut becomes a joke and is only tolerated when it has the character of a joke. So, you know, something, say, abhorrently racist, you know, you, I'm not even going to say stuff, but, you know, think of something that would be apparently racist and now it's turning into a joke, right? The technical method which is usually employed is the illusion, that is, the replacement by something small, something remotely connected, which the hero reconstructs in his imagination into a complete and straightforward obscenity. The greater the discrepancy between what is uh, given directly in the form of smut and what is it what it necessarily calls up in the hearer, the more refined the joke becomes and the higher too it may venture to climb in good society. Um, so I would say, based on that, you know, a racist joke, just use racism because it's an easy topic in Australia, um, could be technically a good joke, um, but that doesn't make it funny, if that makes sense. So, you know, if it, uh, is well enough constructed that, you know, the punchline takes you a few seconds to process and then it hits. Well, that's a well-constructed joke. It is a objectively good joke. Still not funny, you know? Interesting. Uh, I'll throw to Simon after this, but I was just going to say in that case, does it really become a question of aesthetics? Uh, so if for one person who is a racist, that joke is funny. Well, I mean, as in they show the physiological behavioral characteristics of, you know, funny, they're laughing. And for somebody who has been acculturated in a way that they're not racist, uh, 
or at least not racist in the common parlance rather than the uh, structural racist uh, terms used by critical theory, would, would you then say that that joke is funny for the racist but not funny for the the person who's been more adequately cultured according to the common mainstream culture? Sam? I would probably say the racist is wrong. You know, it's very easy for someone, you know, like there's people that think the planet's flat. Doesn't make the planet flat. They think a racist joke's funny. Doesn't make a racist joke funny. You know, it's very easy for people to be wrong, even when it's something that's subjective. You can still be subjectively wrong. And I think in this case they are. Because they're wankers. Fuck them. Fair enough, but I mean, societal facts do change, and they change fairly rapidly. So, for instance, if I make the joke, uh, you know, my my wife came home and she's like, "Why do you have a pistol?" And I'm like, "Oh, you know, I've just got the pistol here because uh, I'm I'm worried about Decepticons." And you know, my wife laughs, I laugh, the toaster laughs, I shoot the toaster. Uh, and, you know, that's funny now, but potentially in a future of transhumanism that joke could be incredibly insensitive and potentially potentially quite offensive. And I guess when it becomes offensive, it probably stops being a joke and becomes um, an attack. You know? Yeah, you can use humour to attack people. I mean, just look at um, any dictatorship, you know? They use it all the time. It doesn't make it actually funny. You know? It's still a joke, just not a funny joke because funny changes. That's what I reckon, at least. Fair enough. Uh, I'll throw to Simon because he's had his hand up for a little while there. Uh, what do you have to say about uh, jokes and hatred? Well, I think you've both highlighted some really interesting concepts. Um, I feel like jokes, as with everything, it's the audience versus thing. So if the audience changes with society, that changes what is considered a joke. So it's this whole time matrices of what society deems to be appropriate and what a, a comedian develops as a joke. And some shy away and try and make very, you know, PG jokes, which is uh, close to uh, – there's a community that call them uh, – I think it's dry humor and they refuse to swear and get cheap laughs. They just use like intellectual jokes. And then there's people like Frankie Boyle, who I'm not going to personally attack. He, you know, he does his own thing, but he tries to flip that line. And some people who like him deliberately go to these things because they know he flips that line. So they might be more willing to take on something that's a bit more uh, close to the line. That might be a bit, you know, he may overstep in areas and thus be racist or be sexist or be any of the ists, but it's how willing the comedian is to flip that line depends on which audience is going to go and see that, which has become a massive issue in the mundane age where things can be recorded and taken out of context and then just sent to the wider public and people just feel offense. Um, Sam, you have something to say? Um, yeah, I guess Sam, um, it really also depends on the position in society, the person making the jokes coming from, you know, like, um, if you've got a heterosexual white male making jokes about a uh, gay Aboriginal female, you know, is that fair, if that makes sense? And I mean, I am not a huge fan of PC culture, despite what this may sound like, um, but I think it definitely needs to be considered the position in which society you sit when you are making these jokes, because, you know, yeah, it, it may be, as I said before, an effectively funny joke. But if you are from the top tier, you know, it's like a rich cunts making jokes about poor people. I mean, OK, that's not funny. Fuck you. Just because you're rich, you know. But that's me. I 100% agree. I it's definitely the. The messenger is as important as the message. Because I feel like there's a lot of stuff that people who are of from a minority can say about the minority because they are a member of the minority. And I totally agree that, like, you know, getting a person who goes, oh, you're offended, but this other person made a joke. It's like, well, because they come from a different place. And it's this whole entire argument that we're brought up a lot, which is uh, I think it's racism. It's the majority to the minority. Prejudice is, I think, can be either – 
direction. It's just like where that line draws and like one is more damaging, whereas the other one is just a between group interaction. Because when it's from a majority to a minority, the minority has a hard time being able to argue against it. Um, I could just go through that whole entire um, race, crime, and justice that I had to sit through. But I feel like I need to hand back to Tim. <laughs> That's all right, Simon. No, I mean, both of you have touched on a pretty uh, important rule of thumb that I think a lot of comedians talk about, which is the punching up versus punching down. So it's always perceived as a good thing to punch up but a bad thing to punch down. So if, if you have power in this particular circumstance, which if you want to get into the interse- intersectionality of it all, is obviously extremely context dependent and also dependent upon the crowd that you're talking in and the particular situation which you're involving yourself in changes the nature of the joke and whether or not it's seen as a playful jab up as opposed to a oppressive foot down on the throat. Although – maybe a little bit beyond the scope of this particular video, it would be interesting to see is this sort of idea of punching up and punching down and fairness in itself a kind of subjective social fact within Western societies, which has developed over the most recent two centuries or so, uh, rather than some sort of universal law of humour. I think, however, talking about oppression and humour, we have sort of started to transcend into Sam's topic uh, where he's going to be talking about humour in an authoritarian context. Yeah, broadly speaking. Um, And, you know, like the quote, I'm actually annoyed that I've cropped the person who this quote is from, so here is an unattributed quote. Um, Humour is the only weapon the oppressed can use against the oppressor. It is an aggressive weapon and a safety valve at the same time. Yeah, so I think that ties in reasonably well with that concept. Um, So, yeah, I was reading a book and there was a couple of funny jokes in it, so that's entirely why I'm doing this. So, joke number one. Um... So some Catholic priest in Nazi Germany died for this joke, by the way. Um, So a man is on his deathbed, right? And he asks for a picture or a portrait of Goebbels on his left side and of Hitler on his right. And the the priest administering the last rite says, why do you want this guy? And he's like, I want to be like Jesus. I want to die with two thieves on either side of me. But yeah, man died for that joke. Um, so what I was wondering is, I'm going to possibly throw this open, is why do people make jokes in situations they know they are very likely to face either like punishment or persecution or actually possibly death for, you know, so what triggers someone or what, you know, what is the motivation of someone essentially willing to die for a piece of humor? What do you reckon, Simon? Um, from my standpoint, I definitely feel like it's that last piece of control. It's that respect that though I can't control the greatest society around me, be it authoritarian, and that I'm under this constant feeling of being watched and being controlled, I have control over what I can do in my head. It's that whole entire like scary thing of thought crimes. It's that respect that they created humor because they can create it. It is something that they can put out into the world. Though they died for it, it's something that can be theirs and it can't be controlled by the regime. It's something that they know is theirs. Uh, That's personally what I take from why people create humor in authoritarian areas. Anyway, uh, Sam? Yeah, like I guess I can totally see that, you know, like this guy's been dead for what? I'm not sure it was the 1940s, so bad at maths, 80 years, right? And here am I, you know, some dude on the other side of the planet retelling poorly his joke. So yeah, you know, that definitely could be part of it. Any thoughts on it, Tim? Yeah, so I was just going to ask, like, so in this particular circumstance, and I mean, in the West and in Australia, we're always going to swivel towards uh, examples of the underdog uh, dying for their beliefs, blah, blah, blah. Uh, But the question I was going to ask is that, from a similar circumstance, you can look at an oppressed group in Australia. And by oppressed group here, I don't necessarily mean a historically marginalized group who is now we're trying through numerous different factors or not trying, depending on the government, uh, to put them back into a situation where they're, they're in a more equal, equal or equitable situation with the mainstream. But there, there are groups that remain oppressed and 
depending on social arguments, should be oppressed. For instance, uh, a pedophile or someone who espouses a violent jihadi ideology. Uh, and these two groups could potentially use humour in, in a similar way to attack what we would consider a democratic and liberal society. So do you think that that humour is exactly the same in the sense of like the humour of the quote unquote um, oppressed uh, who is attacking the quote unquote state who is oppressing them? Or is there something that's fundamentally different between the situation of a jihadi making a joke in jail uh, after being arrested for committing a terrorist attack and, uh, you know, the Catholic priest you've just mentioned making a, you know, a joke at the expense of the Nazi regime? So I'll jump to Simon in a second, but to address that fairly simply. So if, say, a pedophile makes, say in Australia, a pedophile makes a joke about molesting children or something out in the open, what's the likelihood they're going to be murdered for that by the state? You know, pretty fucking small, considering I think the last person murdered, some last state-sanctioned murder was, you know, in the 1970s or 60s in Australia. So I think probably the degree of oppression of these people might be a bit different. Uh, what do you reckon, Simon? I hate that I have to do this, but I'm going to have to clarify pedophilia is the affliction. Child abuse is the action in which you're discussing. There are many people that are considered to have the neurological issue of pedophilia who actually never act on it and who actually validly fight it, which, you know, is an issue in of itself, but that's a mental health issue, whereas child abuse can happen to somebody who does have those associations or do not have those associations and are just sick individuals. Not sick as in mentally sick, sick as in they should not exist. I don't like them. So I just had to start off with that because it's been drilled into me and it was hurting me. Anyway, um, Tim, you want to rebut to that? No, no, no. That's that's fair enough. Maybe I, once again, I've chosen some relatively uh, explosive uh, choices here uh, with regards to uh, my examples. But uh, what what I'm trying to get at is that I suppose every society will always have an oppressed group, and by oppressed group, I mean a group which is non-state sanctioned. For instance, uh, even the most tolerant of societies have to be intolerant of intolerance. So for instance, neo-Nazis in Germany probably view themselves as somewhat oppressed groups. Uh, and I, I suppose if you're saying that the only difference between jokes in an oppressive society is the level of violence, then so say for instance, Sam, in a communist society where these people aren't going to be killed, they're just going to be like, you know, locked in jail, have their uh, particular independence and liberty deprived of them. Do you, do you think in that case that this is still a, a valid uh, difference or is there some sort of like underlying brute metaphysical fact of oppression of an authoritarian regime versus oppression by a liberal regime on a, on a, on a group? Again, so is the, like, so take Germany for instance, um, there's neo-Nazi groups everywhere there. They're thriving. Um, so I don't think the degree of oppression is the same. Yeah, I agree. Like, you know, there will be punishment for intolerance, but it's not because you made a joke. It's because you're intolerant. You know, it's not because you made a joke. It's because you're attacking somebody else. Whereas under the regimes, you're not necessarily even attacking someone. You make a joke about the regime. So an example, um, a man got a three-year sentence in a gulag because he bumped a party member um, as he was rushing through a crowd and the party member got angry and he says, um, sorry, I don't have time, comrade. I've got to go fulfill the five-year plan, quite, quite clearly sarcastically. He's not attacking any individual. He's making a sarcastic comment about the regime and he got three years in jail. If a liberal quotation marks, country responded in the same manner to something like that, then it's obviously not a liberal country because this is, you know, a, a oppressive regime's response. And if you're meant to be a liberal country, you're not meant to be an oppressive regime. You know, if I'm, say, calling for acts of violence against other individuals and you respond oppressively towards me, well, that's because I'm threatening the liberties of others, not because I've said something negative about the regime. So that's probably where I would be drawing the line is 
if you're calling for acts of violence or attacking someone else, then that's worthy of punishment. If you make a comment about the regime or the state, you know, if I call Scott Morrison a bucket of scum, I'm not going to go to jail for it. Scomo from marketing. You know? Yeah. <laughs> no. Uh, we reckon too. Uh, yeah, I think that's a uh, that's a pretty interesting and probably a bit more effective uh, mechanism by which, if you if you're trying to look for a practical means by which to judge a joke which is offensive and maybe deserves social opprobrium as opposed to the intervention of a state, maybe it is like if that joke is about degrading someone's humanity, maybe that's something that instead we we just sort of castigate in a social context, and I suppose taboo does have that role as opposed to a formal legal uh, uh, sort of right, bringing the powers of the state, as opposed to someone who makes a joke with the explicit intention of causing, you know, harm or violence or hurt. And and, and that's, and I mean, intention is always a hard thing to prove, but, uh, you know, the rest of the legal system has to deal with it. So maybe that's where we can really create some sort of a del- delineating factor in, in where a joke is and isn't a harmful tool. Uh, well, unfortunately, I think we've gone a little bit over today, uh, but thank you very much, Sam and Simon, uh, and I think this is a pretty good episode. Everybody else, I uh, hope to hear from you next time. This great warrior has left to his martyr lord.